Hello, everyone. In this lecture, I'll be covering the wonderful and multifaceted NAD molecule and kind of dis discussing why it's so important. We're going to be talking about NAD as it relates to metabolism and its role in the enzymatic control of PARP or PARP and SIRT or CERT proteins. I'll finish with a short review of this recent paper by Wang et al. titled Deletion of NAMPT in projection neurons of adult mice leads to motor dysfunction, neurodegeneration, and cell death, or death, uh, published this year. So I hope you enjoy. NAD, or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and its reduced equivalent, NADH, are uh, critical molecules serving as electron, electron donors in oxidative phosphorylations. NAD, or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and its reduced equivalent, uh, NADH, are critical molecules serving as electron donors in oxidative phosphorylation. And they're also important as enzymatic cofactors. So remember that reduction is the gain of an electron, which in biology often involves the transfer of a hydrogen ion with it, a proton. So NADH is the reduced version of NAD. Most, the most uh, critical function of NADH is its role as uh, an electron donor in the electron transport chain. Electrons that are uh, stripped from glucose and glycolysis or uh, lipids during beta oxidation, for example. Uh, these electrons are not free to roam around the cell. That's called a free radical. Instead, these electrons are very uh, procedurally picked up by NAD to become NADH. And they're, this NADH is then transferred to the mitochondria and it's handed off to uh, complex one. These electrons then run through the electron transport chain and they during this process, they pump protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane. And this proton gradient is used to crunch inorganic phosphate with ADP or AMP. And this is what produces ATP. And ultimately though, NADH is the critical um, molecule in the production of ATP. So although that this is really interesting, it's not actually the focus of this lecture, it's just a little bit of background. So where does NAD actually come from? Well, NAD is synthesized de novo from the amino acid tryptophan and nicotinamide. Nicotinamide is a molecule that is derived from niacin, a, a vitamin. This de novo synthesis pathway is how NAD uh, gets into the body. It's derived from your diet. Certain enzymes use NAD as a source of ADP ribose groups, which is an important post-translational modification. Uh, one such enzyme is PARP or PARP. PARP stands for poly ADP um, ribose polymerase. And as the name suggests, PARP uh, catalyzes poly ADP ribosylation reactions. And in general, these uh, ADP ribosylation reactions are involved in DNA repair and also apoptosis. And again, these ADP ribose groups that are attached onto other proteins are derived from NAD. So in the same way that ATP is a source of phosphate during phosphorylation, NAD is a source of, of ADP ribose groups during uh, PARP uh, ribosylation. CERT proteins are deacetylases that are uh, also sometimes they function as mono ADP ribosylases and they require NAD as a cofactor. And CERT proteins are primarily uh, NAD dependent deacetylases. So in order to catalyze the removal of, of acetyl groups from target proteins, they require NAD as a cofactor. And the specific proteins that are targeted by CERT proteins uh, are gonna be discussed in a second, but suffice it to say CERT proteins regulate apoptosis, mitochondrial biogenesis, autophagy, and many other pathways through this NAD-dependent deacetylation. ADP ribosylation and CERT protein deacetylation converts NAD into NAM, or NAM, and it must be shuttled through the NAD salvage pathway in order to be regenerated into a usable molecule. 
when serp proteins deacetylate or PARP proteins polymerize an ADP ribose chain, the NAD gets used up and it gets released as NAM. So the pool of bioavailable NAD is constantly being depleted. And uh, NAM resembles NAD enough to where it can function as a negative regulator of the proteins that use NAD. In other words, NAM inhibits PARP and CERT enzymes because it's so similar to NAD. And so this functions as a negative feedback loop that we see in many different biochemical pathways. And in this context, it simply functions to prevent the overactivation of enzymes. Uh, defects in NADH concentration, uh, PARP and CERT enzymatic activity, electron transport chains, and NAD salvage pathway are all intricately tied to neurodegeneration. And this isn't to say that any of these specifically are the root cause of neurodegeneration, but they are frequently implicated. And they may simply be a common downstream consequence of cellular dysfunction. But nevertheless, these pathways are at the center of a lot of current research. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to learn why dysfunction in these activities can really disturb cellular function. And lastly, niacin deficiency, and thus NAD deficiency, causes dementia and neurodegeneration. So we know that a lack of NAD causes brain cells to die. But as to whether it's a driving force or a potential therapeutic target in, a, in any particular disease, it isn't known. Anyways, let's examine some of these pathways more in depth and see exactly why NAD is so critical for the cell. Okay, so let's start with where we get our NAD from. And a lot of NAD comes from our diet. This is the de novo synthesis pathway. I'm not gonna go into all the enzymes, but it comes from nicotinic acid and tryptophan. Tryptophan. So uh, nicotinic acid and tryptophan can be um, eventually end up forming NAD. And I'm not sure what the specific enzymes that do that are, but we're just gonna say turns into NAD. And NRD, NAD is our, our star player of this pathway. And the main function of NAD is going to be generating NADH. So NADH is, is, is key to the electron transport chain. Uh, electron transport chain. It is the reduced equivalent of NAD and it provides the electrons that go into generating the, the proton motive force, which makes our ATP. So NAD is critical to making ATP. And the production of NADH from NAD uh, comes from beta oxidation when we're degrading lipids or glycolysis if we're breaking down, um, for breaking down glucose, also the citric acid cycle. So a lot of our biochemical pathways are going to be right there. And NADH is what kind of comes out of it. Aside from metabolism, however, uh, some other important pathways that NAD functions in. You may have, you may recognize these two proteins. We have uh, PARP, mentioned that one. And we mentioned CERT, PARP and CERT proteins. And what CERT proteins do, as we discussed in the last slide, they will deacetylate some protein. So down here, let's say we have a protein and it deacetylates. So CERT proteins are deacetylating, uh, deacetylating multiple different proteins. And this process generates NAM, NAM. We talked about that. And PARP proteins also depend critically on uh, NAD. What pro PARP proteins do is that uh, they take a some kind of substrate protein, like here, and they attach ADP ribose groups to it. It's just a post-translational modification. Getting a little bit clustered here, but this PARP protein is uh, adding poly-ADP ribosylations onto this other protein. And this also generates uh, NAM. 
So the, the byproduct of both CERT deacetylations and PA, uh, RP uh, poly ADP ribosylations are NAM. And NAM inhibits both uh, CERT proteins and PARP proteins. So this is a form of negative regulation. The downstream product of its enzymatic activity comes back around and inhibits the original enzymes. Uh, it's an important regulatory mechanism we see in lots of different enzymes. So NAM, other than that, isn't very useful for metabolism. How do we get back to NAD from NAM? There is a specific pathway for that. And this is going to be called the NAD salvage pathway. It involves uh, two enzymes. One enzyme is NAMPT, which we're going to be discussing here. NAMPT is the enzyme that turns it into NMN. I'm not sure what it stands for. And then NMNAT1 or 2 turns NMN back into NAD. So NAM gets turned into NAMPT, or sorry, NMN by NAMPT, then NMNAT1 or 2 turns it into NAD. And interesting about NMNAT2 is that it actually prevents axon degeneration. It's the WLD uh, mouse that was originally discovered to have axons that don't degenerate. And the protein that was found to do it was a relocated MNNAT2. It was found that it was mislocated to the um, axon terminals instead of the cell body, which is where it's normally found. Anyways, interesting factoid. So this is a general metabolism of NAD. And now we're going to talk more specifically about CERT proteins and PARP proteins and what they, uh, what they actually do. On this slide, let's focus on CERT. So CERT proteins, um, as I said, they mediate deacetylation. So they're going to be deacetylating. Uh, and they are critically reliant on NAD. NAD is actually the limiting factor in the deacetylation of the CERT mediated deacetylation of proteins. So when is NAD around? Well, NAD is around during low energy conditions or starvation. So when NADH is used up, it gets turned into NAD. And that's where NAD comes from. And when NAD is, is, is present, we get increased CERT activity because NAD is the limiting factor in uh, uh, CERT's enzymatic activity. Another interesting protein that, uh, as far as I know, is the only protein we know that inhibits CERT proteins. Uh, it's DBC1. Um, uh, it stands for duplicated in bladder cancer. It's just a protein that was found or sorry, deleted in bladder cancer. It's found to inhibit CERT. So the when certain cancers might delete DBC1, and by deleting DBC1, they upregulate CERT, which we're gonna see why in a second that's a pretty useful thing for a cancer cell to do. So uh, CERT proteins start deacetylating things. What's something to deacetylate? One important thing that um, CERT proteins do target I should, I should mention that there's actually, uh, I think, seven isoforms of CERT proteins. Uh, CERT1 is primarily cytoplasmic. CERT3 is primarily in the, um, in the mitochondria. CERT5 is primarily in, um, or CERT6 is pr primarily in the nucleolus. Anyways, the specific localization doesn't matter too much, and a lot of them do overlap, um, but just know that there's different isoforms that may have uh, slightly different targets. Anyways, one of the main targets of CERT deacetylation is the P53 protein. I do have a presentation on P53, but I will summarize it by saying P53 likes to uh, cause apoptosis. And CERT-mediated deacetylation of P53 works to inhibit it. So CERT indirectly prevents apoptosis through P53. Another target of CERT's deacetylation, let me try that again, 
is weird. Uh, CERT mediated deacetylation also inhibits uh, NF kappa beta. NF, NF kappa beta. NF kappa beta is um, a protein that's involved in inflammation. And by inhibiting NF kappa beta, it's indirectly inhibiting inflammation. So NAD, hmm, there we go. NAD uh, prevents inflammation by inhibiting NF kappa beta, which is a transcription factor that leads to the production of pro inflammatory um, molecules like IL 1 beta or caspase 1. The deacetylation, another important deacetylation target, are ATG proteins. Uh, CERT mediated, mediated deacetylation of uh, ATG proteins actually activates them, and CERT proteins lead to a, um, um, autophagy. So uh, CERT proteins, again, are activated during you know, low energy starvation conditions, and they lead to autophagy. That's not a coincidence. You want autophagy to be upregulated when NAD is low. Another important factor that CERT proteins activate is PGC1-alpha. Uh, I forget what it stands for, but it's a master biogenesis uh, transcription factor of mitochondria. So it's a transcription factor that promotes the production of mitochondrial enzymes and promotes their replication and in general promotes mitochondrial health. So again, deacetylation is generally thought of as a good thing. In that case, another factor, uh, PPAR gamma, leads to um, lipid metabolism. It's another transcription factor that's critically involved in lipid metabolism. And lastly, we all know histones can be acetylated or deacetylated. Um, so they actually can act on histones, CERT proteins, can function as our traditional uh, HDAX, histone deacetylases. So it deacetylates histones, which in general will uh, inhibit gene expression. So it depends on this, on this specific gene, but in general, removing the acetyl group will expose the positive charges of lysine or, or arginine which will then be attracted to the uh, negatively charged phosphate backbone of the DNA. And that will pull the histones closer to DNA and it'll make it harder for transcriptional enzymes to get in there. RNA polymerase can't get in there as easily. So this isn't um, any particular pathway, really it's just a conglomerate of all the different important pathways that we see CERT proteins mediating. Uh, really quickly, CERT proteins limiting factor, NAD, uh, DBC1 is known to inhibit CERT proteins. It can bind it, inhibit them. When CERT proteins begin deacetylating stuff, they can inhibit apoptosis by inhibiting P53. They can uh, prevent inflammation by inhibiting NF kappa beta. They can promote autophagy by acetylating ATG proteins. They promote mitochondrial biogenesis through the PGC1 alpha transcription factor. They promote uh, lipid metabolism by upregulating PPARY gamma, another transcription factor, and they influence gene expression by deacetylating histones. So on this slide, we're gonna talk about um, PARP, P-A-R-P. And a lot of the activity of PARP happens in the nucleus, the nucleus. So let's draw our DNA. Say there's a DNA lesion right there. So the DNA has been damaged some event, and PARP is actually one of the first responders to DNA damage. It can bind to DNA damage, and uh, PARP functions to uh, attach these poly ADP uh, ribose groups, these, these chains onto different proteins. And specifically, it does it for uh, many different DNA repair proteins, like XRCC1 or um, BRCA1, BRCA1, and so let's get these. 
So PR PARP is going to be poly ADP ribosylating them. And let's see if I can draw that chain. So this is just a typical post-translational -trans, uh, modification that seems to respond or seems to be upregulated during uh, DNA damage. And this process, of course, requires NAD, and it uses NAD in that process as well. And this generates, um, this can generate NAM. So out of that process, we can we can see an upregulation of NAM, NAM. And NAM can come back and inhibit PARP, or it can inhibit uh, CERT proteins. So CERT proteins are kind of generally thought of as good, right? But um, generation of NAM through PARP activation can generate high levels of NAM, which can come back and inhibit CERT proteins. And if we inhibit CERT proteins, we, you know, we see increased, I don't know, P53 signaling. We see um, loss of PGC1 alpha. So we see less mitochondrial biogenesis, and we see a couple of other problems as well. But just something to keep in mind. See, PARP activation can also, interestingly, it can generate uh, free PARP chains. This is another um, poly ADP ribose group, and they can actually diffuse out of the nucleus, which I thought was really interesting. So this will be our nuclear membrane. And these poly ADP ribose groups can diffuse out of the nucleus. And when they do that, they like to travel to the mitochondria where they bind a particular protein called AIF. AIF stands for apoptosis inducing factor. And it's a protein that's found both inside the mitochondria and bound to the membrane of the mitochondria. And these poly ADP ribose chains can bind onto AIF, and this somehow facilitates the um, detachment of AIF into a, a mobile form. AIF is cleaved or it's it gets away from the mitochondrial membrane. And when AIF is then free from the mitochondria, this apoptosis inducing factor does just that and go back to the nucleus and promote apoptosis. And that's a process called parthanatose. Um, parthanatose. It's a, a type of apoptosis. And again, it's believed to be triggered by low levels of NAD. If NAD is, is low, it leads to increased P, uh, of these, these PAR chains, PAR chains, poly ADP ribose chains, which can translocate to the nucleus, or sorry, to the mitochondria and release these AIF transcription factors to promote apoptosis. Another important protein that uh, I haven't discussed here where can I put it? Let's just put it up here. Is called uh, PARGE, and I think the, another one is called TARGE. These are proteins that uh, degrade these par, uh, parallelation chains. So we talked about how these chains are attached onto different proteins. So in the same way that a deacetylase removes acetyl groups, or a dephos or dephosphatase can um, can remove phosphorylation groups. These PARGE and TARGE enzymes remove these poly ADP ribose chains. And this turns out to be a really important function, right? They, they're degrading these poly ADP ribose groups because when, when PARGE or TARGE is knocked out, if you knock these guys out, the, it induces apoptosis. It causes a neurological disease, brain cells die, so apparently the uh, degradation of these um, poly ADP ribose groups is a really important function. And it's presumably to, to free up NAD 
because um, ADP essentially gets locked up in these long parge chains and it's not bioavailable. So you need parge to slice it back up and release the um, NAD so it can be used again for other activities such as you know cert protein activation. Uh, just a really quick correction. I said that low levels of NAD causes this, this pathway to happen. Uh, what I meant was that high levels of NAD promotes this parthanatose pathway and also high levels of DNA damage. If you have lots of DNA damage, then you have lots of uh, PARP activity and you have lots of production of these PARP uh, PAR chains, which can lead to AIF. So this parthanatose pathway that leads to cell death is primarily promoted by low energy, which means high levels of NAD and DNA damage, which is what activates PARP. The bioavailability of NAD, like I said earlier, is the rate limiting step to many of these different cellular pathways and enzymes. And NAD can be synthesized de novo from or be regenerated via the NAD salvage pathway. Small molecule activators of this NAMPT, which we discussed, have been shown to protect against motor neuron degeneration. But the importance of this pathway for neur neuronal survival is not very well understood. NAMPT, remember, is one of the two critical enzymes needed to convert NAM back into NAD, the other being NMN AT. But uh, NAMPT is the rate limiting step in the uh, regeneration of NAD from NAM. Uh, Wang et al. in this paper that we're going to discuss uh, sought to characterize NAMPT and the NAD salvage pathway in general by examining cellular defects following knockout. So Wang's team took a very straightforward approach where they crossed a mouse with a floxed NAMPT and a mouse expressing Cre under the uh, Thi1 promoter. Um, it, this is a promoter that's only activated in projection neurons. So the end result is that NAMPT was deleted only in projection neurons of the, the motor cortex. And it was also an inducible system, which I won't go into the details, but basically is simply Cre fused with estrogen and it translocates to the nucleus when tamoxifen is administered. Anyways, it's a simple and it's a great approach. And I think, um, I think it's a great way to examine any particular protein. So what happens to neurons when NAD, uh, the NAD salvage pathway is completely disrupted? Well, this is what they found. First, NAMT, uh, PT knockouts in the mouse motor uh, projection neurons resulted in significant neurodegeneration in the affected neurons. Maybe not surprising, the NAD salvage pathway is, is important and this suggests that the de novo synthesis is not uh, su uh, sufficient to keep neurons alive. So how or why did they die exactly? Well, NAMPT deletion did not appear to affect the rates of apoptosis, autophagy, uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, uh, mitochondrial fusion, parylation, or protein acetylation. So if we think back to the previous slides, NAD played a, a big role in each of these processes but it appears that cell death was occurring independent of each of them. Instead, it turns out that the loss of NAD salvage pathway was likely inducing cell death by severe energetic deficiencies because the electron transport chain was not working, was, was inefficient. The electron transport chain without an adequate supply of NAD and thus NADH is unable to keep up with the high energy demand of, of a neuron and they die. So, although interestingly not via the conventional method of apoptosis, which I thought was a little bit confusing because you think uh, energetic deficiency would probably lead to apoptosis, but apparently not, not too sure about that. Okay, yeah. so, so what's the big deal? NAMPT deletion causes cells to die, lots of gene deletions cause neurons to die, right? Well, NAMPT might be particularly important because ALS patients have reduced NAMPT expression. And ALS, ALS mouse models are rescued by dietary NMN. So NMN is the uh, product of NAMPT, 
that's picked up by NMN81 to produce NAD. So NAD deficiency due to a lack of NAMPT might actually be uh, might actually have a role in um, ALS in the real world. And so that's how this paper is very applicable to motor neuron disease. So the animal model they're using in this study have a Floxed uh, NAMPT gene indicated right here by the F. And they also have a tamoxifen inducible Cree enzyme driven by a motor cortex specific promoter. So let me repeat that. A Floxed NAMPT gene and a tamoxifen inducible Cree enzyme that's driven by a motor cortex specific promoter. So the Cree is only expressed in the motor cortex and it's only active when tamoxifen is administered. On the left, we see the, uh, the effect of administering uh, tamoxifen, or sorry, on the left, we see um, no tamoxifen being administered. We see a healthy motor cortex. And on the right, we see um, the effect of administering tamoxifen, which induces uh, Cree translocation to the nucleus and NAMPT deletion. You can see, uh, in the, so new N is a, a uh, marker for neurons, a broad marker of neurons. And you can see the number of neurons is vastly downregulated. <clears throat> so there's roughly half as many um, surviving neurons in the motor cortex and also the sensory cortex, which is interesting. And there's n uh, not any neurons missing in the, hip <clears throat> the hippocampus, which makes sense because the promoter is supposed to be a motor uh, cortex specific promoter. So the question now is, how does NAMPT deletion lead to motor neuron cell death? Well, they looked at many different possible culprits, including uh, rates of autophagy, uh, apoptosis, the amount of CERT protein activity, the amount of PARP, PARP activity. But ultimately, that what they found was that the rates of mitochondrial respiration were the primary cause of NAMPT deletion-induced cell death. So they performed this, uh, what's called a, a seahorse assay, a seahorse assay, which involves placing a cells into, uh, some cells into a very special chamber that can measure OCR, ox oxygen consumption rate. Remember, when o um, oxygen is the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain, so measuring how quickly uh, oxygen is depleted tells us how efficiently the electron transport chain is, is functioning. And OCR is measured following the administration, uh, administering of all these different drugs, oligomycin, FCCP, rotten one, rotten one. Um, and all these different inhibitors are meant to kind of tease out uh, the specific defects in mitochondria, like spare capacity, basal ATP production, uh, proton leak. But what, what basically what's important is that the OCR is the oxygen consumption rate under normal conditions, which I think is probably the most important part right here, tells us that uh, the OC, our oxygen consumption rate is roughly 40% uh, decreased in NAMPT deleted cells, suggesting that mitochondrial dysfunction arises from defects in the NAD salvage pathway. The authors wondered if dietary supplementation of NMN, NMN, uh, the product of NAMPT, could boost the, the survival of NAMPT deleted mice. So in this Kaplan Meyer, which let me move this, this uh, Kaplan Meyer uh, graph, what we're seeing, this is what's called a survival curve. We see in blue what happens when. Um, how quickly animals die following tamox tamoxifen treatment, which would induce NAMPT deletion. In about 10 days following TAM tamoxifen, almost all the uh, animals have perished. But in red, we see something different. In red is the treatment of mice that are uh, receiving NMN supplied in their drinking water. So that vastly improved their survival. Um, following uh, tamoxifen treatment and NAMPT deletion.
Next, the authors turn to a more uh, real-world application, looking at the amount of NAMPT in ALS patients. ALS patients. Uh, so they're, they're, they performed a Western blot using motor cortex tissue from deceased ALS victims, and they found that the amount of extracellular NAMPT, which are these, these brighter bands, the extracellular NAMPT is actually upregulated which to me uh, indicates that perhaps glial cells are sensing uh, NAD depletion and perhaps they're secreting more NAMPT to try and counter the, the defects. Um, but what's interesting is the amount of intracellular I NAMPT, intracellular NAMPT is decreased. You can see in these lower bands, it's very faint. I just covered it up. But the amount of intracellular NAMPT is, is downregulated by roughly 50% or so. And so a loss of NAMPT can, we know from these experiments, can definitely cause mitochondrial dysfunction and cell death. And ultim ultimately the authors are, are suggesting that the loss of NAMPT could be contributing to ALS uh, cell death. And it, it may be therapeutic, it might be therapeutic to supply these patients with NMN to perhaps um, counteract these defects in the NAD salvage pathway. So I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. If you have any questions at all, please comment and let me know. And thanks for watching.